tips on a charm. Give me a large knife sharp like a razor this instant. I have to castrate the person who made this sauce and I want to avoid any unnecessary suffering. A recipe of culinary chaos. Chef begins Thursday at 9.30 on BBC One. Rimmer has his head in the clouds in Red Dwarf 5 on BBC Two shortly. At 5.45, a young boy and an alien team up for a dizzying ride through space and time. You are the navigator. At 10 past 7, Bruce and Rosemary join the Navy to present a special program of Generation Game Highlights. Do you want to take yours home? And at 10 past 8, Annika's back. Well, the BBC have sent me to prison for this series of challenge. Can't be why. Fortunately, the only bars are steel girders, and the race is on. And at 9.20, the television premiere of Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Hasta la vista, baby. Saturday night on BBC One. You can rely on it. Saturday night. Trust me. In half an hour, the concluding part of the true-life drama in which a mother battles for final justice. That's at 9.30. After the main evening news now on BBC One with Peter Sissons. It's 9 o'clock. The woman in charge of the Child Support Agency says she's stepping down. She concedes that 17 months of protest and controversy over the agency's pursuit of absent fathers have taken their toll. Jerry Adams says there should be an immediate demilitarization of nationalist areas in Northern Ireland. And Roy Castle, cancer, sufferer, fighter and campaigner, is dead. Good evening. The chief executive of the Child Support Agency, Ros Heppelwhite, handed in her notice today, still strongly supporting its objectives, but admitting it had been an exceptionally demanding post. The agency started operating 17 months ago, but found itself at the centre of constant controversy, being blamed even for suicides, as it set about extracting maintenance payments from absent parents. Two months ago, Ms. Hebblewhite made a frank admission of the agency's failings and apologised to its clients. Today, the Social Security Secretary, Peter Lilly, praised her courage and dedication to the job. Conflict and controversy. That's been the history so far of the Child Support Agency. Absent parents claiming the agency is demanding too high a maintenance payments, while single mothers believe it isn't chasing non-paying fathers hard enough. Ms. Hebblewhite personally came in for heavy criticism, most recently when the agency was discovered to have failed to reach its financial targets. News of Ms. Hebblewhite's resignation was treated as a victory by fathers' groups. We think today's news is really good, it's really fantastic, it's a real milestone in the campaign against the Child Support Agency and it's a milestone in the campaign against the injustices that this government is trying to perpetrate on larger and larger sections of the population. But campaigners for lone parents fear her departure could signal further concessions to the CSA's opponents and a reduction in the amount of maintenance paid to mothers. But the fear is that there's some major change coming from government because however badly the agency was doing under Ross Heffelwhite, she stood by the policy. And our fear is now that government will move away from the policy and lone parents and their children will end up worse off than they were before. In her letter of resignation, Ms. Hebblewhite said she felt it was time to step down from what was an exceptionally demanding post. She said she strongly supported the objectives of the Child Support Act and hoped that in time they would be more widely recognised as an important and necessary innovation. In reply, Mr. Lilly said he fully recognised the exceptional pressures on Ms. Hebblewhite and he thanked her for her courage and dedication in introducing the child maintenance reforms. The agency has missed every one of its targets and above all, it's um, let down the children it was supposed to help. My one hope is that the government has learnt some lessons, that they won't expect uh, the new uh, chief executive simply to defend the indefensible, but they'll really get down to listening and changing the system. I hope the government will listen. They certainly need to listen. Everybody has been affected by this all across the board, and we really need time in the next session of Parliament to change the legislation, not just the person at the top. Ms. Hepplewhite's successor will be Anne Chand, a career civil servant and the current head of the National Insurance Contributions Agency. Could like Ms. Hepplewhite, she'll find herself in one of the hottest seats in Whitehall, facing what's expected to be another critical report from the All-Party Social Security Committee this autumn.
The government says it remains committed to the principle behind the agency that parents be financially responsible for their children, but the pressure for change has been intense. Whether Ms. Heppelwhite's departure eases that pressure or indicates further reform is not yet clear. Richard Hannaford, BBC News, at the Child Support Agency in London. The Sinn Féin leader, Gerry Adams, has said the government must make an immediate start on withdrawing the security forces from Catholic areas of Northern Ireland. He told a news conference in Dublin that all raids, searches and arrests should stop following the IRA ceasefire. But he appealed for calm after a Catholic man was shot dead by loyalist terrorists. He said the IRA would not be provoked by any group trying to wreck the peace process. The security force is on patrol in West Belfast tonight, still on the alert despite the IRA ceasefire and still facing the threat from the loyalist paramilitaries whose activities continue. John O'Hanlon was shot dead as he worked on a car at a friend's house in a Catholic area. Two men climbed over the garden hedge and opened fire from close range. The first victim of terrorism since the IRA ceasefire came into effect. The outlawed loyalist group, the Ulster Freedom Fighters, said they'd carried out the murder. John O'Hanlon was killed in North Belfast, the most concentratedly violent few square miles in Northern Ireland, a network of small Protestant and Catholic ghettos, which has seen a fifth of all the deaths in the 25 years of the Troubles. It was an appalling act, a cowardly act, uh, but one aimed uh, quite specifically to terrorise the Catholic community in particular and the community in general in North Belfast. I believe that it is intended to try and destabilise the uh, peace process uh, in Northern Ireland and in Belfast in particular. The Sinn Féin president, Gerry Adams, at a news conference in Dublin, said the IRA would not become involved in what he called knee-jerk reactions to the murder of Catholics by loyalist paramilitaries. The IRA, he said, would not be provoked by anyone who was trying to wreck the peace process. Later, though, in a BBC interview, he said the government must move on what he called demilitarisation now. Because of government restrictions, his words are spoken by an actor. The watchtowers along the border, the cratering of cross-border roads, the repressive legislation, raids and arrests, searches should stop immediately. All these things need discussion and dialogue and negotiation. But let us be sure that we're looking for a transformation of this situation, of a policing service, and the RUC is not that policing service. Even so, Sinn Féin held a protest outside the RUC station, nearest to where last night's murder was committed. Perhaps an example of what they're calling the new phase of Republican struggle. There was never much question that just because Republicans called a halt, the Loyalist paramilitaries would follow suit. Tonight, around 150 people on the Shankill Road, a Protestant heartland in Belfast, held what they called a victory rally, deliberately mirroring Republican celebrations earlier in the week. Also tonight, reports from Dublin suggest that another Republican group may be about to announce its own ceasefire. Sources close to the INLA, the most unpredictable and reckless such organisation, which was responsible for the murder of leading Conservative MP Erie Neve in 1979, may well announce a complete cessation early next week. But loyalist terrorists carried out the first murder after the ceasefire, and also the last one before it. The funeral of Catholic Sean McDermott, found shot dead in a car near Antrim on Wednesday morning, took place in Belfast. The increasing hopes for peace are little consolation to the bereaved. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. President Clinton says he's delighted by the ceasefire and has promised a peace dividend for the people of Northern Ireland. He met the Irish Foreign Minister Dick Spring this afternoon and discussed the prospect of additional American aid for the province. The White House has been quick to highlight the President's role in the peace process, but some Unionists are angry at his apparent support for Sinn Féin. The Irish Foreign Minister's hastily arranged flight to the President's holiday retreat at Martha's Vineyard is a measure of the prominence the Irish peace process is being given in the United States. He's the only foreign guest invited to break into the presidential vacation. So, on his arrival, Dick Spring sought to allay Protestant fears about the extent of American influence. Oh, there's no reason for unions to be nervous. I can understand any reservations they might have, but I'm sure that President Clinton would want to reach out to unions as well. At his borrowed vacation cottage, a relaxed US president appeared to greet his guest, clearly delighted with the occasion, and the chance to highlight his own role in facilitating what's being portrayed here as yet another international peace breakthrough. 
After 30 minutes of talks, he emerged with his Irish guest to make his first direct comment on the IRA ceasefire. The United States is strongly supportive of this peace process. Uh, we want to reach out to, to work with all the elements in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. We want to, all the communities to feel a part of the peace process and to feel that there is a peace dividend. We want to continue to work with and support the work of the government of Ireland and the government of Great Britain. And uh, we are prepared to take some steps uh, to do whatever we can. President Clinton doesn't want to upset the British government by publicly overstating the extent of U.S. influence, but both the Americans and the Irish seem keen to play up the importance of President Clinton as peacemaker. I believe that the American role the President Clinton's administration has been a vital one. Uh, President Clinton is a friend of both the British and Irish governments, and indeed the communities in Northern Ireland. That has been constructive, and I would hope it will be seen that way by both communities, and it will continue to be constructive. At a news conference after the meeting, Mr. Spring said he expected American involvement now to be largely financial. We didn't actually go into the detail of figures, uh, but I would be hopeful that uh, substantial sums would be forthcoming, but this can be worked out over a period of time. US officials are warning the president can't commit himself to direct aid until he's agreed it with Congress, so any talk of an aid package is premature. But President Clinton clearly wants to remain closely involved in the promotion of an Irish peace process. Bridget Kendall, BBC News, Martha's Vineyard. Businesses in Northern Ireland are likely to receive considerable international aid if the ceasefire continues. Ireland's European Commissioner today said he expected a very substantial contribution to be made by the European Union. But as our business correspondent Peter Morgan reports, a lasting peace may not lead to the economic recovery that many people in Northern Ireland have anticipated. Roy Bailey's printing company employs around 100 people in the countryside outside Antrim. The firm moved here 20 years ago when its plant in Belfast was blown up. Since then, he's faced tough competition from his rivals and tough questions from his clients. Well, they would say, um, how can you guarantee delivery? Uh, what happens if your factory's bombed? How can you guarantee delivery? Uh, are you sure that uh, you know, you're going to deliver the goods on time? Questions that companies outside the province would not have to answer. Across the road, a Taiwanese video company has opened. Peace could bring more foreign investment, but it's in tourism where most jobs would be created. The chairman of the tourist board estimates 10,000 in five years. The Northern Ireland tourism contributes only 2% to our economy here, compared to 6% in the south and 8% in Scotland. So we've got a, a long way to catch up. But a peace dividend wouldn't benefit everyone. A whole industry created around security could now crumble. The police here, the, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, has probably got a manpower three times as high as it normally would have in peacetime. So something like two-thirds of the jobs are going to go over some period of time. We, we don't know how quickly they'll go, but they will go. And of course there are quite a number of people who are dependent on the, on the spending of the police and on things like the reconstruction of bomb-damaged buildings. The critical factor in determining whether a peace would make Northern Ireland more or less prosperous may well lie back in Westminster, and whether the government is prepared to maintain the £7 billion a year it spends here, or if faced with reduced security needs, the Treasury would demand a peace dividend of its own. Peter Morgan, BBC News, Belfast. Another three days of industrial action have been announced by the RMT Rail Union. This means four days of disruption are now planned for the next three weeks. The next stoppage will be for 24 hours on Thursday, with a two-day stoppage on the following Tuesday and Wednesday, and another one-day strike on Friday the 23rd of September. The announcement came as a leaked letter from Railtrack confirmed it's considering sacking striking signal workers. But the company insists this is just one of the many options it's exploring. The man in rail tracks driving seat has a very tough decision. With no deal in sight, does he allow the dispute to grind on? Or does Bob Horton, rail tracks chairman, opt to tell the strikers to work normally on new terms or be sacked? Lawyers for rail track are studying the matter with the sacking option in the front of their minds. Under it, rail track would move in stages. It would start by inviting strikers to accept its offer. A week later, it would warn strikers that they will be dismissed if they go on strike. And a fortnight later, strikers would be dismissed and told they could come back on the new terms or if they guaranteed not to strike. Outside legal opinion is that it could be done, but it would be costly and contentious because procedures like dismissal take time by law. Cutting it short would let sacked strikers lay claims totaling millions of pounds. 
European employment law rests on social partnership, negotiation and consultation uh, is, is a path which I would advise employers and employees always to pursue rather than this sort of strategy which will inevitably end up in the law courts. Both sides now hurtle on. The union called the 48-hour strike the week after next and won the Friday the week after that is already one next Thursday. It's coming to a crunch. Each side blames the other. Real Track have been secretly planning a strategy for sacking our members, uh, secretly planning to use large amounts of taxpayers' money, at least 16.5 million, uh, and I think there'll be a public outcry about that. Both sides now run high risks. The union risks losing support with another two-day strike, which hits its members' pockets harder. Railtrack said it's already lost £100 million and each striker £1,000. Its risk now is that if it sacks signal staff without ready replacements, it might make the dispute much more serious. The decision will probably be taken before the political temperature rises with the party conferences at the end of the month. It seems likely that any decision like this one that risks shutting the network would go to a high political level. Stephen Evans, BBC News, Paddington Station. Two more people have been taken ill after drinking contaminated tonic water bought at a Safeway supermarket in Edinburgh. In all, eight people have now been affected. The latest victims bought a bottle of own brand tonic water from the store at Hunter's Tryst last week. It's the fourth bottle found to contain a derivative of deadly nightshade. The police have warned consumers to be vigilant. The entertainer Roy Castle has died just two days after his 62nd birthday. He'd been suffering from lung cancer. Today his wife said there should be no flowers, no fuss, no mourning, just lots of joy. Nick Hyam looks back at his long career. Dancer, singer, comedian, trumpeter, Roy Castle was one of the great all-round entertainers. For more than 20 years he presented the BBC's record breakers, concocting stunts like getting a world record number of tap dancers together. The man himself went parascending under ten bridges across the Thames and flew across the Channel to France the hard way. His daredevil escapades made it all the more shocking when this fit non-smoker turned out to have lung cancer. Now when you get in trouble... He himself believed his illness was a byproduct of his early success, his health destroyed by other people smoking. One of the reasons that I've possibly developed this cancerous growth in my lung is because whilst playing the trumpet in smoky rooms, I inhale great gulps of air. You have to fill your lungs and you're getting all that smoke. You're bashing it into your lungs there. And so that's the way it, it happened to me. He decided to make public his battle with the disease. He was filmed undergoing chemotherapy, which caused his hair to fall out. The much-loved song and dance man became a campaigner, almost until his death. Less than two months ago, he toured 11 cities in three days to raise money for a lung cancer research unit on this site in Liverpool. He was ill. He was very ill. He was weak. He was tired. He felt sick. His bowels were upset. But in spite of that, he wanted to do it, and he would get up time and again to take the microphone, to smile in that way that only he could smile, and to talk to people. A fellow star with him on the first night of that tour today paid tribute to a great entertainer. He was the consummate professional. He was a just wonderful performer. Above that, though, and I think this is how I really remember him, he proved to me that what it was like to be a successful man. He faced life and ultimately he faced death and he faced them both equally strongly. He and his wife Fiona were sustained by their religious faith and a deluge of letters of support. Roy Castle himself offered fellow cancer sufferers this advice. Believe in the doctors, what they've learned, and go for it. And really do what they say and live as normal a life as you possibly can. Don't whine, laugh. On Sunday evening, the BBC will broadcast a special programme, Sweet Inspiration, in which Roy Castle talks about his life. It'll be shown at 6.25 on BBC One, except in Scotland, where it'll be on at 11 o'clock. 
The three Western hostages kidnapped by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia more than five weeks ago have again appealed to government forces to stop attacking the base where they're being held. In a video released this morning, the three men, who include a Briton, Mark Slater, say that negotiations for their release broke down because of the attacks. These pictures were taken on Monday deep inside Khmer Rouge-held territory. Mark Slater was called on to do most of the talking. Oh, my name's Mark Slater, English citizen, 33rd day activity. The medical supplies and food sent into the camp appear to have had an effect on the prisoners. They look healthier than they did earlier in this crisis. But there's obvious despondency at the lack of progress in the negotiations to bring them home. We understood the deal was going down tomorrow to pay the ransom, but we, on the 30th, but we've heard that because the bombing hasn't stopped, uh, there's no longer a deal tomorrow. If the bombing doesn't stop, there'll never be a deal. There are only a few brief glimpses of the kidnappers themselves, but the guards do make the hostages demonstrate the way they take shelter in trenches when they come under fire from shells. The government here still denies bombarding the camp, but despite the tension between the two sides, there was more evidence today of increased activity at the airport. It's believed negotiating teams are being moved in and out of the area where the men are being held. This video was released with the full approval of the Khmer Rouge. The timing could be significant, coming amidst mounting optimism in official circles here that the kidnappers may be softening their position. It's possible the guerrillas could have decided that these pictures should be seen as a sign of good faith, proof that they're not physically mistreating the three men. Michael Peshart, BBC News, Cambodia. A court in Romania has adjourned the trial of a British couple accused of trying to buy a baby. Adrian and Bernadette Mooney from Berkshire were arrested in July after a baby girl was found hidden in their car. The case was adjourned for a fortnight because the baby's teenage parents have no lawyer. Six-month-old Monica is being cared for in a Bucharest orphanage. The future of the Russian space program has been saved by the skill of one of its cosmonauts. Commander Yuri Malinchenko managed to dock the Mir space station with an unmanned craft bringing vital food and supplies. Automatic docking had already failed twice this week and the cosmonauts faced abandoning Mir if today's maneuver was unsuccessful. As the wayward cargo ship was inched towards the Mir space station, the tension down at mission control was palpable twice before it had floated away and almost damaged the space station. This was the last chance. There was relief rather than celebration as the cargo ship was finally grabbed and the flight controllers congratulated the cosmonauts on the success of their high-risk, delicate maneuver. Mir commander Yuri Malenchenko was launched into space just two months ago on his first mission. Today, he effectively rescued Russia's space program, for if the docking attempt had failed, the Mir station would have had to be closed down, scuppering dozens of planned international projects. If something happens, there is a breach of agreements with Japanese, with the United States, with uh, European Space Agency. No funds, no possibility. And so it, it, it was very dangerous, but things got it. Everything ended very well. Failure would have cast serious doubts over Russia's participation in the prestigious International Space Station, which is funded mainly by the Americans, but will rely heavily on Russian technology. The Russians will be keen to prove that this week's docking problems were a minor setback, and that their technology is as reliable as anyone else's. Angus Roxburgh, BBC News, Moscow. Cricket Warwickshire have moved a step closer to completing a historic grand slam of all four major trophies by winning the Britannic Assurance County Championship. They easily beat Hampshire at Edgebaston this afternoon to make sure of the title. The county has already won the Benson and Hedges Cup this season. Tomorrow they play Worcestershire in the NatWest Trophy final. The England cricket selectors have announced the squad for this winter's Ashes Tour of Australia. 
former captain Mike Gatting is recalled at the age of 37, but surprisingly there's no place for his Middlesex teammate, the seam bowler Angus Fraser. The full 16-man squad is Atherton, Stewart, Gooch, Hick, Thorpe, Crawley, Gatting, White, Rhodes, De Freitas, Goff, Udall, Tufnell, Benjamin, McCaig and Malcolm. Nicola Carslaw reports. Mike Gatting's been given the chance to repeat his success of seven years ago, the last time England held on to the Ashes in Australia. Maybe not as captain this time, but as an experienced old hand. On the golf course today, Gatting was well aware that his inclusion in the squad at the age of 37, along with another former captain, 41-year-old Graham Gooch, was controversial, veterans being selected ahead of younger contenders. They know what I can do. Um, I've had a reasonably good season again, so, you know, 37, I mean, that isn't really old. And if there are some youngsters there that are, that are doing equally as well, then fine, take them. But if they're not, then, then why shouldn't I go? And criticism was dismissed too today by England's chairman of selectors, Ray Illingworth, who announced the 16-man squad at Old Trafford. Well, I think we've got a right balance. We've got five players in there as batsmen who can play for a lot of years yet. The two experienced ones are, well, I think, in the best two or three players in the country anyway. But also the very good players of spin bowling, which could be very important out in Australia. And we just think that they are the best players. Perhaps the biggest surprise was the omission of the fast bowler Angus Fraser, an England hero last year. He gives way to Martin McCaig, a formidable fast bowler brought up in Western Australia. The man under the most scrutiny will be the skipper Mike Atherton, following his much publicised troubles with the game's authorities. The cricket has gone well. Um, the other side of it's not gone too well, but hopefully these things will pass. England must be hoping to build on their success against South Africa, but the Australian campaign's bound to be tougher. Nicola Carslaw, BBC News. The people of Belgium have begun a month of celebrations to mark the 50th anniversary of their liberation from the Nazis. Hundreds of British veterans have returned to Brussels to commemorate the Allied campaign, which was led by British forces under Field Marshal Montgomery. Belgium's unprecedented tribute to her British liberators. Fifty years on, the Union Jack is the first foreign flag ever allowed to fly below the Saint-Contenaire Arch, which dominates Brussels. Even the mayor, Freddy Tielemans, is named after a Yorkshire soldier. He was born within days of the arrival of the British. Unlike the French, the Belgians never suggest they liberated themselves. It was British tanks which were first into the capital. The Welsh guards just beating the Grenadiers by 25 minutes after an extraordinary race across Belgium, slowed only by the ecstatic crowds blocking the roads. Everybody was so excited that it was unbelievable. Nothing but garlands of flowers, bottles of wine and so on, you know. In fact, we were most embarrassed. <laughs> the great port of Antwerp was the other British goal. Five Royal Navy ships are in the harbour where the crucial locks and bridges were saved from German sabotage by the Belgian resistance. The Duke of York came ashore this afternoon to help lead a weekend of Thanksgiving. In Brussels tonight, he opened a huge British trade fair, promoting some of the products which have made this small country Britain's fifth largest export market. Few here object to the mixture of commerce and commemoration and almost every British tradition seems to be on display. God save the Queen! God bless Belgium! Tonight, the Grenadier Guards beat the retreat, making new friends and remembering old allies. It's going to be an extraordinary month as liberation and the liberators are fated in towns and villages across the country. James Robbins, BBC News, Brussels. And tonight's main news again. The chief executive of the controversial child support agency, Ros Heppelwhite, has decided to step down. There'll be more on Newsnight at 10.30 on BBC Two, but from the 9 o'clock news, good night. Good evening. Verdicts of unlawful killing have been recorded at an inquest on three members of a Midlands family who were found dead at their bungalow nearly two years ago. Despite extensive inquiries by West Midlands police and the offer of a £5,000 reward, no one has been charged with the murders.
A relative of the Smiths left the coroner's court with police officers after hearing that the family may have been tortured before they died. Nearly two years later, the murders are still unsolved. All three members of the family, Harry Smith, his wife Mary, and their disabled son Harold, were tied up, gagged, stabbed and beaten. Mr. Smith Sr. had been stabbed a hundred times. At a news conference after the inquest, West Midlands police said their inquiry would continue until someone was charged. In spite of an intensive search of the Smith's bungalow and the area around it, the murder weapons have never been found. A motive for the killings has never been established. The police say it was probably theft, but nothing was stolen. Almost two years on, the sadistic killer who murdered the Smith family is still at large. Five million pounds has been given to researchers in the West Midlands who are trying to find a cure for cancer. The money's been allocated by the Regional Health Authority. It'll be spent at new research laboratories in Birmingham, which bring together some of the world's leading doctors and scientists. The money will finance another laboratory and a sophisticated computer system to track the success of cancer treatment across the region. Security staff at Jaguar in Coventry have gone back to work. They'd been striking over plans to contract out their jobs to the security firm Group 4. Union officials say the company has now withdrawn its plan, but a spokesman for Jaguar said the strike had been called off while negotiations take place on a range of issues. Well, that's our news tonight. Have a very good weekend. Good night. Trigger Happy Women, ways of getting fired in Britain's obsession with corporal punishment. Michael Moore's TV Nation investigates on BBC Two in a couple of minutes. Good evening. Tomorrow's weather will be in great contrast to today's for almost everywhere. You can see the change taking place, so it's not obvious, but this cloud here and this string of rain is really the herald of much moister and slightly warmer weather, but without the sun. Of course, it's night time now, but this rain will edge in across Northern Ireland tonight into Western Scotland, Wales and the southwest by dawn. Most of it is going to be drizzle. It'll increase the mist and the fog on the hills and the moors. By tomorrow lunchtime, it'll be moving eastwards and I think by dusk probably reach the extreme east of England. There will be some heavier bursts later on in the day, but first of all tonight and before the cloud gets in, it'll be as chilly as it was last night. That's for most of central England and central Scotland, but temperatures rise, as you can see, later on in the night. Now, the wind we've had today has been light. We're picking up a southwesterly with this next belt of drizzle. And after that, you see a hump appearing, a suggestion of a ridge of high pressure, a suggestion of fine weather to follow what's coming on Saturday. So there could be some good news later in the weekend. So we start off Saturday with fine weather for eastern Scotland, probably eastern England, and that cloud picks up, mostly drizzles, I've pointed out, with some heavy bursts later in the day. And as they go through, so Northern Ireland could well end up with a drier, if not that much sunnier, end to the day. Temperatures will be at their highest in the east, 20 to 21, because that's where the sun will be out longest, 17 or 18 further west, and with a good deal of humidity, that actually won't feel too cool either. Well, there's Saturday lunchtime's chart. We'll move that ahead, and this is Sunday, and that is our ridge of high pressure. So we start Sunday, then probably quite cloudy and dull, maybe drizzly in the extreme east. That'll disappear during the day. Then a few hours of brighter weather before the next belt of rain. This is probably going to be more significant rain comes into the southwest. That'll move fairly quickly in towards Scotland, northern England, Wales and the southwest, to be followed by windier, rather blustery and showery weather. And if we look ahead to the start of next week, that's the hint. A brief spell of fine weather and then tight isobars. This suggests some organisation of the showers and some of them will be heavy. So a blustery start to next week. An organisation worth $30 billion. An organisation with a worldwide reach, with politicians in its pocket and violence in its heart. For $10,000, I could have you killed. Colombia's Cali cartel. The drugs it sells and the money it launders. Dirty money. BBC One's three-part investigation into international finance begins Tuesday, 10.20. The flames of 21st century war, transported through time to the streets of L.A. It's a battle to control the future. And there is no remorse. Lose, and everything is history. Hasta la vista, baby. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Terminator 2. Tomorrow is Judgment Day. 
Now on BBC One, we have the second and final part of the True Life drama starring Patty Duke and Martin Sheen. Tonight, Mary continues her relentless fight for final justice. Chris went down to the Marine Corps recruiting office yesterday, and he got a consent form there for me to sign. To do what? I want out of here, Mama. Oh, gosh, she's coming this way. Hi, Mama. I'd like you to meet my wife, Dusty. I will not have that woman in my home again. Well, that's just fine, Mother Mary. I was saving the blessed news for the right time. And I do believe this is the right time. How would you, uh... Civilized, hospitable Southerners put it. I'm with child. You're a whore. You're crazy. We want Dusty served with divorce papers. But most important, we want to make sure that she can't get her hands on Christine. You know what, Chris Brown? I wish she was dead. I wish I could put on a pretty black dress and pretend to grieve all over your dead body. Mrs. Brown, we don't have any jurisdiction over civilians. Now, even if we suspected your son's wife of conspiracy, we couldn't touch her. Maybe you can't, but I can. You can do what you will, but you ain't gonna take Christine. Never see her again. Is there a is there a phone anywhere around here? Well, there's one about four or five miles from here. Hey! Hey, show me your door! Hey! Here's a misdemeanor and... Misdemeanor? That woman kidnapped Christine. Her own daughter, ma'am. We have custodial rights, ma'am. Miss Brown, Mr. Brown, I want to help you. I really do. But these are liberal times, and I got to be careful. I go chasing somebody across the state line, and I got trouble myself I can't handle. How the hell with it. Harvey, would you come with me, please? Billy and Frank, will y'all follow us in your pickup? We're going to go after them ourselves. I don't. I'm going to bring it back. Parker, one week ago, legislation was passed and signed into law by the governor making parental kidnapping a felony in the state of Alabama. Yeah, 
Cast. We got no information on that. It's cast, Parker. It's on the books. All we can do, ma'am, is nothing, apparently.